Good evening, and welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. See a lot of old friends here. Hi, Queenie. <laughs> um, Fiji is in the house. All right, good. Uh, it is great to be with you all tonight. Um, this is uh, just a, a fantastic, fantastic book, fantastic author. Uh, my great colleague, uh, Chris Johnson, is going to take over the show in a minute. But just, I just wanted to deliver a couple opening remarks and welcome you all here to CSIS. Um, first, first off, I have to say, you know, the book, of course, is called Confucius and the World He Created. Um, many of you have seen it on the web, but please take a look at how beautiful this book is and buy two or three of them in the back. We, we, ha we you know, we have that. I mean, it's, it's not Christmas for a while, but Easter is coming up and there's many other holidays that you can share with your friends. Um, absolutely. I, I bought this for my uncle who's in Florida. My, hi, Uncle Jerry. He's watching on, on the webcast uh, because he can't be here tonight. And uh, this is something that I've had a lot of people say to me. I wish I was in town because I, I just want uh, to, to be there for this event. So what we did was we webcast. And so, you know, we have probably as many people or more in this room watching online. So thank you all for watching online. Um, in addition, if you want to watch this event again, we'll have it on, on demand on CSIS.org. Uh, you can follow CSIS at CSIS. Um, I wanted just to give a couple opening remarks. Michael Schumann, uh, of course, is Beijing-based author and journalist. He's a former Time correspondent uh, based in Beijing since 2002, reporting on Asia-related issues in the global economy. He also previously worked at the Wall Street Journal for six years in Forbes. Uh, he's been in Asia as a journalist for 16 years in total. Uh, he's also uh, author of the international bestseller, The Miracle, an epic story of Asia's quest for wealth. Um, Michael's interviewed leading uh, people in Asia uh, throughout the years, including South Korean President Kim Dae-jung, uh, Singapore uh, PM Lee Kuan Yew, uh, Taiwanese President Ma, uh, Philippine President Arroyo, and more. Um, he also attended dinner in North Korea with Kim Jong-il, uh, uh, which not many people say they, can say they have. <laughs> um, and hopefully we won't get in trouble with the North Koreans tonight. So. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, but with that, I, I, uh, I know you all came here to hear from Chris and from Michael. So please, with your applause, will you welcome uh, my colleague Chris Johnson, Michael Schumann. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. Well, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, we're, we're very pleased to see such a big crowd. Uh, you know, it's... Uh, What's fascinating to me about Michael's book is, as, I w as we were thinking about this event, we were sort of th I was sort of thinking, well, this is somewhat of a, an esoteric you know, subject, but I think when we think about, when we think about the role that Confucius is playing now uh, in Asian societies, and especially in my neck of the woods, China, and the changes that we've seen uh, in the way the Chinese Communist Party uh, interacts with Confucius as a concept, uh, I think it's very relevant and timely uh, and for us and has uh, very significant policy consequences. Um, so with that, uh, I noticed I got promoted to Dr. Johnson. I'm very happy with that. Uh, I don't think you did, so. No, 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 no. <laughs> but that's okay. Um, so I think, Michael, one of the things that you maybe just start us off by by sort of suggest, I mean, one thing that really struck me in reading the book is that it's almost like you were on a narrative journey as you were going through the different chapters, you know, and, and sort of, I liked the way that you broke down the different pieces uh, and how he has been sort of maintained relevance by being interpreted and reinterpreted over and over right. again. Uh, so maybe you can share with us kind of your thought process as you were putting, you know, those parts of the book together and, 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 and was it something where as you did the research it led you down different paths or did you kind of have right. a vision for where you were going and, and was there a central organizing principle that you were sort of trying to get at in the research? Uh, I think uh, most writers would like to say, oh, I knew exactly where I was going <laughs> from the very beginning, but that would not be true. Now, I, w this was actually a very new subject for me uh, because my background is actually in economics. Mm. And I started on this mainly because um, I couldn't find a book on the subject that answered my questions mm. about Confucius and who he was and why his ideas became so important and what they mean today. And so I really started from zero. I started with a, a 
carrying around a copy of the Analex in my bag and <laughs> literally started, started reading some of the old texts and, and building from there. And uh, what I started with and what I ended up with were actually, actually quite different. I think we all have an image of, most of us have an image of Confucius in our minds already uh, and what he stood for, that he's some kind of crazed arch conservative or uh, he's, he believes in autocracy and he hates women and all these other things about him. <laughs> Uh, and then when you go back and, and, and read the original writings and you see what happened over time and how, how things played out, you end up with a very different idea about Confucius and what his role really was and what he meant his role to be and, mm. and, how, that's, and how that has changed, and, but also why his ideas are so important today still, despite all of the centuries of change politically, economically, socially, uh, why, we're, why we still need to talk about Confucius now. Mm -hmm. And, and, and on those lines, uh, something I was very intrigued by in the kind of chapter on you know, Confucius the man, uh, the, the person, uh, was this sort of like uh, uh, sort of epilogue of failure. You know? yes, <laughs> every, yes. every time he turned around, yeah, right. he never achieved really any of his main goals. He no. did not have the influence. Uh, we were talking uh, in the green room a few moments ago about you know, someone analogous to Diogenes in, right. in Greece, you know, walking around with a lamp of truth, but was seen as sort of a gadfly perhaps uh, right. at, right. at the time. So can you expound on that a, a little bit and, and you know, maybe draw out for us the distinction between uh, how that process occurred while he was alive and then how he was resuscitated or, you know, how he came right. back into the fore, if you will. Yeah, I mean, the actual story of Confucius, I mean, even in, the, even in the texts that are written by people who are obviously big fans of Confucius, uh, really uh, paint him as, as a man who, who very much meant well in his life and achieved in the end very, very little. Mm. Uh, he was born in the 6th century BC into a time in China that was uh, very violent where you had a lot of petty kings and dukes all fighting, fighting, out, fighting it out for, for treasure and for territory. And uh, he developed a doctrine um, that he, he felt was based on the wisdom of an even earlier age in Chinese history uh, that he believed would restore peace and order and prosperity to China. And he basically spent a life wandering around attempting to get people to listen to him. And in the end, uh, he, he didn't. Hmm. And I think, I fear that he died thinking that uh, his quest had failed and, and uh, his, his ideas were, uh, would never really gain hold. Hmm. Uh, but where he did excel was as a teacher. He, he had collected around him uh, very loyal uh, students who we know as his disciples. We don't know how many there were. Uh, the numbers range uh, between something like 70 and 3,000, so we don't really know. But he had a, he had a core group of loyal followers who uh, were devoted to him for his entire life. And they carried on his message, and they, they found students of their own, and those students found students, and <laughs> so on, so on, so on. They started to write down what he said. Confucius did not write the Analects, though, mm -hmm. but we don't think that he did. Mm -hmm. uh, we think it was probably the students of his students mm -hmm. who started writing down what he said, which was a big thing back then, to have your, your thoughts written down. Mm -hmm. uh, and his message got carried on, and it became a, a, a more and more complex doctrine that eventually came to be seen as basically the, the foundation of Chinese civilization. Mm -hmm. And were you able in your, in your sort of work to, to determine, was there, was there distortion that occurred you know, because of that process of you know, right. uh, stories, if you will, that were handed down and handed right. down again? I mean, and again, that's sort of a religious analogy, somewhat similar to the teachings of Jesus in this regard, right. Right? You know, written much later than actual events. Right. Did you, did you, were you able to kind of parse those issues at all? Well, there's all kinds of uh, stories and myths about Confucius and, and his life. Uh, there's, there's some great tales about uh, how he, he, was, he was a supernatural being who had some kind of uh, 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 um, super being as a, as a father, kind of like the old Greek myths about mm -hmm. You know Perseus and that kind of thing, <laughs> uh, but he, but more importantly for us today, it was also his ideas that also got reinterpreted and reinterpreted and interpreted some more and refashioned some more and those refa those reinterpretations got reinterpreted uh, depending on what was going on at the time and what the needs were and what what ideas were popular and 
So what happened over the next 2,500 years is that Confucius' teachings began to take on all different kind of ideas and forms. Mm. Uh, some of them, maybe not all that positive. Ultimately, mm. uh, some of them very, uh, some of them uh, maybe much more spiritual than the original teachings. Mm. Some of them more political. Uh, but the Confucius, there's 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 no one Confucius. There were multiple Confuciuses who were all very important in their own times. Mm. And the Confucius that we think of today is not the Confucius of 200 years ago. And, mm. Definitely not the Confucius of 2,000 years ago. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Um, you, one thing I'd be curious about, you know, we're, we seem to be now in the region in another era of uh, discussion of unique Asian values. Uh, the, the Chinese right. President Xi Jinping has sort of talked about Asia for Asians, and, right. and there have been other leaders who have talked about this. This obviously was very much in vogue in the 90s, and, and you know, was there a distinctive... Right. Uh, and the whole debate, uh, especially relevant to China right now with regard to so-called universal values or, or Western values. How does he fit into the, to the picture there? And, and do you think that, uh, you know, in some cases, these governments have un, unfairly uh, hijacked right. some of his uh, teachings? Uh, he's playing a very important part right now because I think what the Chinese government is, is attempting to, to do is present an alternative system to... American style democratic capitalism. Mm. And they're trying to say, much as you said, much as Ed Lee Kuan Yew did in the, in the 80s and 90s in his Asian values argument, <clears throat> that uh, Western concepts of democracy and human rights are not universal, that uh, nations have their own political history based on their own uh, cult culture and their own philosophy. And uh, China has. Um, is presenting a challenge to the West that's not just economic and political and strategic, but also ideological, uh. saying that we have our own system that we, that we like better than your system, and uh, we think our system is actually rooted in our own, in our own culture. Uh. And Confucius is playing a very important part of that be uh. because the, the government in Beijing sees him as a, as a, a truly indigenous political tradition uh. that they think uh, can support the current regime the current authoritarian regime, uh, while kind of holding off these uh, uh, more dangerous, from their view, dangerous ideas mm -hmm. of Western democracy and, and human rights. Mm -hmm. So Confucius has become part of this, this much, much greater vision of China's role in the world, what China wants to be, uh, what the Chinese government, what, what Chinese political future, what, what the Chinese Communist Party wants the political future for the country to be. Right, right. Yeah. And an interesting possible contradiction, of course, to that is, is the notion that you highlight in the book of, of how he, he and his followers, but particularly his followers, were keen to um, reform the governments that they were serving in or right. under rather than somehow try to seek to undermine them or, or overthrow them. Uh, to some degree, that works to the Communist Party's you know, sort of bent, uh, but also there's a question of defining what reform should be. So do you have a feel for how his initial teachings fit into that, and then right. how do you see that being used in the current context living in Beijing? I mean, what, the, the Confucius that the Chinese Communist Party is latching onto now is very similar to the Confucius that the old imperial governments used. You know, there was this imperial Confucius that stressed ideas like hierarchy and loyalty and obedience. Uh, filial piety was, became a very important idea in the imperial years, and this was this is all designed to uh, support what is really an authoritarian government at the same, and while at the same time making it look like the emperors had the moral right to rule. Mm. Uh, what's happening today is, to a certain extent, the new emperors of China, the leaders of the Communist Party, uh, are basically dusting off this idea with some small changes on the margins and trying to use Confucius in the exact same way. What's interesting when you go back and, and read the original writings and the, the original ideas, uh, that's really not what Confucius was about at all. Mm. Um, he was, his, his political message was one of, of virtue, that uh, he wasn't about coercion. He was about the, the power of, of uh, a benevolent government, that if a leader is truly benevolent and truly cares about the people, that uh, coercion becomes unnecessary, that, People will love the guy so much that they'll just follow him willingly. <laughs> and who needs laws and punishments and all that stuff when in armies and this would all become somewhat uh, unnecessary uh, when virtue, ta virtue takes hold. Um, Confucius came out very clearly against things like the death penalty, mm. uh, abuses of power, 
Confucianism was very much about the constraint of absolute power, not, not the practice of absolute power. Right. And I think what's interesting today is now that the Chinese government has uh, become, uh, it, it have become accepting of Confucius again and is, uh, is actually encouraging people to go back and read the old writings and, mm -hmm. and find, uh, reconnect with Confucian traditions and ideas. What will they find? Will they, will they, will they find the uh, Confucius of Xi Jinping? Will mm -hmm. they find uh, different Confucius? Mm, uh, that means something else to them. And, and maybe uh, they'll find a Confucius that doesn't share the political ideas of the mm. Chinese Communist Party. And then what, is, what does that mean going forward? Well, related to, I mean, just as you were talking, I did, what jumped to mind was, you know, uh, what did Confucius have to say about corruption? <laughs> right. <laughs> and the anti-corruption campaign and so on. How do you see that? Well, uh, actually, what, what's, very, what's really interesting about that is that the President Xi has actually tried to employ Confucius in his anti-corruption campaign. Yeah. You, you very often see him quoted, quoting Confucius <laughs> or other Confucian thinkers when he's addressing officials uh, or party, party cadres. Mm. And I think that he feels that uh, the, the government and the, the country at large, to a certain extent, could be could could help could could be helped by a good kind of old-fashioned dose of uh, Confucian morality. <laughs> uh, so he's he's act, you'll see in in the in the newspapers uh, editorials about how really good government civil servants uh, should follow Confucian ideas and th things like that. Um, so uh, Confucius himself obviously was very much about up, upright government and mm -hmm. uh, putting the interests of the of the nation, the greater good over your own interests. So in, in that way, it, it fits quite nicely. Um, whether he'd agree with the way the current government is going about his anti-corruption campaign, well, that's another story. Yeah, that's a different <laughs> issue. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the issue of filial piety and, and its importance, uh, I would assume, not just in the China context, but, but regionally. Um, to what degree do you think, though, that uh, that whole concept has Created problems, or you know, has has had unintended consequences that that have been negative. You know, you mentioned before you engaged in this enterprise, your focus is economics and, and business coverage and so on. Right. How do you see uh, Chinese and other Asian business culture uh, reflecting those Confucian values? And and you know, there's often commentary about how innovation is a problem. You right. know, things like this. So how how do you see right. that in the context of your work? From the economic standpoint, I, I there's there's some good and bad. Uh, I think there are some. Confucian ideas that have infiltrated into corporate practices in, in East Asia, and I think it's, uh, especially in South Korea, Japan, well, more so than China, mm -hmm. that uh, I, th I think are quite positive, and I think some companies here in the U.S. might want to might want to look at them, could solve some of our problems. I mean, most of all, what I found what I found really interesting uh, during the the last financial crisis, when when companies in, in the U.S. were laying off millions of people. Uh, you found companies in Asia putting out press releases about we will not lay off one one person, you know. And, and I met managers and, and talked to them about this and said, well, why are you, why are you doing this? And they they suddenly they don't necessarily even call it Confucian or Confucianism, <laughs> but they suddenly start talking about well, we have responsibilities to the family, mm -hmm. the, the company being the family, and I'm I'm the head of the household. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm the, I, I had one South Korean businessman actually say, well, I'm I'm the head of the family. Mm -hmm. So I have to behave in that way, mm -hmm. uh, and they felt that it was basically um, morally inappropriate uh, to be cutting people uh, from their jobs who who had families of their own, mm -hmm. uh, and they were willing to make sacrifices in the short term for that. Yeah. They also think this is great business in the long term. Uh, <laughs> that you, as Confucius would predict, uh, if you treat people well, they'll be they'll treat you well, and uh, they'll be loyal. So they feel that they have a loyal, well-trained workforce mm. uh, that they can count on over the long term, and that saves them the cost of having to recruit and retrain workers all workers all the time. Mm. Uh, on the on the downside, I think you'll you'll find that one problem that companies face in Asia, especially in Japan, is that some of the concepts of hierarchy and filial piety have become so entrenched yeah. that uh, younger staff members are kind of deprived of their voice. Uh, th things become too top-down, and, and that suppresses innovation. It suppresses op open discussion. Mm -hmm. And when you talk to uh, kind of corporate uh, consultants and things like that in Japan, and they start talking about what's wrong with 
Japan Inc., they, again, no, won't necessarily use the word Confucian, but what they're talking about is this kind of overbearing hierarchy that's seeped into the major mm -hmm. Japanese companies that mm -hmm. has kind of stifled their the nimbleness that they need to compete mm -hmm. in the modern world. So uh, filial piety has, a, I guess, has its good and its bad, depending on how it's manifested itself. Right, right. Um, obviously, there's been you know controversy about these Confucian institutes you know that have been established right. in, in in various places. Um, you know, you mentioned that you sort of discovered a different Confucius than you had thought. You know, when you went into it, what's your sense of of how the teachings do or do not comport? You know, with these institutions, and uh, how do you see that as a as a concept? It's the. the Confucian Institutes really have nothing to do with Confucius. We're not actually teaching anything about Confucius, <laughs> but uh, China has, has using Confucius as, as basically a brand or a soft power ambassador, mm. uh, trying to capitalize on his image as a, uh, for wisdom and pacifism to uh, allay the world's fears about what a rising China means and what China's role will be in the world. Uh, where they become <laughs> controversial is in some academics criticize the program for being an attempt by China to control the discourse at right. universities around the world about China. Hmm. What, what happens when you have a Confucius Institute, in very simple terms, and there's, the Chinese government is basically supporting Chinese yeah. studies at your university, and they have a certain element of control over what those, what those programs are, are about. So to a certain extent, it's a university kind of outsourcing their <laughs> Chinese studies uh, to the to uh, uh, the Chinese government, and mm -hmm. what does that what does that mean going forward? And I think they've there's been enough sensitivity about this that that's why you've seen uh, some prominent universities rethink yeah. their relationship. University of Chicago is one, Penn right. State, Pennsylvania State University. Mm -hmm. They decided this is really not something we, we want to be a part of. Mm -hmm. When you bring this up in China, that you know Chinese officials are like, well, this is a perfectly this is a, a benign program where we're supporting Chinese language and. And also, they'll they'll say, we don't want China to be just be known for you know making making iPads, and we want we want China to have a different role, a greater role in the world, and a, and a greater part in global civilization. And this is our way of, of doing that. So I think this is a controversy that's going to be be raging on over the next few next few years. Mm -hmm. Obviously, here at the center, you know, in our name, uh, strategic studies is something that's very important to us, and, and obviously international relations and so on. Uh, I think we see President Xi certainly moving in somewhat of a different direction with regard to sort of China's international profile and so on. Did you detect in your research do, do Confucian values or statements or, or sort of thought play any role in that sort of shift of, you know, China's, uh, you know, it's our time sort of <laughs> mantra right. that's been popular under Xi Jinping? Well, the Chinese, one of the favorite words of the Chinese government these days, as, as you know from following the speech, is harmony, Yes, harmonious society. Mm. And I, they very much mean that domestically. Mm. But I think they're also pointing it globally, internationally, definitely regionally. Mm -hmm. uh, I think China wants to paint an image of itself as um, being, being a, a world power that Will will bring will not bring confrontation with its with its rise. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, you could argue that runs counter to its actual actions on the ground in the South China Sea, its relations with with Japan, its relations w w with India. So, to a certain extent, you have this two different things going on. You have kind of the the realities of China's relations with its neighbors, mm -hmm. which in many cases are not all that positive. Uh, and you could argue it had deteriorated in, mm -hmm. in the last two or three years since Xi Jinping, mm -hmm. who's taken a much more aggressive stand. And on the other hand, there's, on, on the other side, this kind of, uh, this open kind of PR campaign to make it look like China wants a different role in the region mm -hmm. than, it, it, than I think its neighbors are experiencing right now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, to be kind of fair to Beijing, I think they've realized a the disconnect recently, and even mm -hmm. I think you've noticed that they've they seem to have pulled back in some of these territorial disputes, and mm -hmm. they're trying to ease things over with Vietnam, and mm -hmm. suddenly things have gone a little bit quiet with Japan and mm -hmm. things like that. I think they realize that their, the rhetoric about what they want the rise to be and the actual practice of what their policy was had started to, to diverge to the point where it's becoming a problem for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it will be interesting to see as China continues to gain in, in, in influence and 
across the board, uh, economic, political, military, uh, whether it's this uh, harmonious China that turns out to be the, the dominant force or whether it's kind of the more nationalist or aggressive China. Yeah. I think one of the, certainly one of the, you know, on that theme, one of the key relationships that's been very interesting to watch the development in the last year or two is China-South Korean relations. Right. Um, and obviously in South Korea, as you mentioned, you have a deeply Confucius, uh, Confucian society. Right. Um, do you see a role uh, that the, for, you know, sort of synergies around Confucianism or would China seek to use that as a, as a sort of common bond uh, between the two countries to help? I mean, obviously the economic relationship is right. what draws them together most closely, right. but do you see an element of that sort of ideological uh, convergence, perhaps? I think Beijing would very much like to recreate what China had in the imperial days, which is uh, uh, a, cultural, a cultural affinity throughout the region that uh, led to Great China that contributed to China's great influence in, in East Asia. Uh, whether or not that's actually going to uh, happen in the modern world, uh, the, the South Korean relationship I think is a fascinating one with China. On the one hand, China is of course immensely important to South Korea uh, on the economic side. Uh, its companies are have a very influential role in China. Uh, the Chinese benefit tremendously from all the all of the Korean investment. Uh, Samsung sells a lot of phones in China, and, and uh, they benefit greatly from it. And, and I think you've seen periods too where the where Seoul has actually grown closer to Beijing on some on, on political and strategic issues as well. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you know, you those all the old tensions and the old concerns about what a rise, rising China means for South for Korea, especially based on its own rather tortured history in the region. Uh, those don't go away either, sure. and I, th I think you'll find that China's actions with Japan and, and the Philippines and Vietnam have only heightened South Korean concerns that uh, China's rise may not be positive mm -hmm. for Korea over the long term. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think you've seen um, a rather substantial decrease in anti-American sentiment in mm -hmm. recent years in South Korea. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know when the last time I've seen a a big anti-American protest in Seoul, mm -hmm. uh, and of course the government attitude has become much more, pro much more pro-American as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I think this is something China is facing uh, across the whole region, mm -hmm. where everyone benefits greatly from China's rise economically, yeah. but everyone seems to be a little wary about what that mean, what that means for them strategically. Mm -hmm. uh, China would like some of these Confucian ideas to kind of help smooth that process over. Right. But then there's the reality of the, what's going on on the ground. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I yeah. think it's, it's been interesting to watch, it seems to me, despite some of the hand-wringing, especially here in Washington, about that relationship. You know, Madame Pock seems to be consistently drawing a bright red line around the security relationship, and, and I think the Chinese are, are, are sensitive to that. Um, one thing that's interesting, I think it's fair to say, and we've been seeing it in our narrative uh, here with, um, you know, we've had some recent pieces in prominent newspapers by prominent China scholars about uh, the party being doomed uh, and, and, and so on. And, and, and it's, I think it's emblematic of the fact that when you look at the, the reforms that were part and parcel of the third plenum, I mean, these are very structure and, and, and sort of systemic changing right. uh, events. Right. And I think it's provoking a societal debate, right, about what kind of China do we want to be. Right. Um, and in some ways, I think it mirrors uh, some of the debates that took place in the 80s over direction and, and you know, this sort of thing and ideology. Uh, do you see the Confucian phenomenon playing in that societal debate and, and, and does the leadership see that as helpful, unhelpful? Does it depend on who's making the argument? Uh, how, do you, how do you see that? Uh, yeah, I, I think what China is attempting to do, right, first of all, the, the, the leadership is facing immense challenges mm. right now. Mm. Uh, they're facing a, an economy that has uh, basically, I, I think the high, the high growth period in China is, is effectively over. Uh, we, are, we are not going to see 9%, 10% growth rates again, at least not with any consistency. So you're looking at a, and, and a government that for the last 35 years has, has based its legitimacy on rapid development and rapidly rising incomes. Mm. Um, 
and those that's going to become harder to achieve mm -hmm. going forward. Mm -hmm. And what they need to do to to keep that great that great miracle story going uh, is going to take a, a degree of reform that that some have characterized to me as being even harder than what Deng Xiaoping engineered in 79, 80, right. uh, where you're, 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 you're getting at a, a fundamental change in the, in the government relationship with the economy and therefore with society. Mm. And that shows up in the third plenum document, which sure. is very, very sweeping mm. uh, in its nature. And really, really, it really means that a communist party that has maintained tremendous levers of control over, over Enter private, enter private and uh, state enterprise, uh, losing a lot of those levers. Mm -hmm. um, and the way Confucius fits, fits into all of this is uh, the party has had realized already quite some time ago that just delivering material benefits is, is not enough to sustain the regime over the long term, that they have to stand for something more, something bigger than that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how they turned to Confucius in the first place. Marxism was supposed to be <laughs> that, right, that, that core foundation <laughs> uh, that, that doesn't work so well anymore. So, uh, so they've gone back to, and, and of course, they, they don't want Western ideas right. about democracy and elected government either. Mm -hmm. So they, they said, we need some other form of legitimacy. We need some other way of, of, of justifying the government as it is. Mm -hmm. Uh, and oh, you know, this Confucius guy can probably can probably help us. Mm. And they they uh, they think that it, it's a way of the, having the the country move forward ec economically mm. without necessarily moving forward politically. Right. You know, one one of the one of the challenges that Xi Jinping is going to be facing, probably the biggest challenge is that he wants to bring about a, a more and more dynamic, more open economy, mm -hmm. if you believe the policy statements, uh, while having effectively no change on the political front and probably very little change on, on the social and civil society front. Yeah. So how do, you, how do you engineer this? Mm -hmm. I don't think we have any idea. <laughs> I, but uh, I think that he's hoping that a return to Confucius as a... As a uh, a true Chinese political tradition, mm. or should I say, a f the form of Confucius he wants to reintroduce, mm. uh, can help with this incredibly complex process mm. of reform, uh, and uh, he to somehow smooth over the contradictions that are mm. kind of embedded naturally embedded in that process. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you mentioned it a moment ago, and I think it's very important. Uh, you know, this whole notion of finding new forms of legitimacy. And, and one of those, I think, uh, especially when it comes to issues of Tibet and Xinjiang and, and other areas, right. there's a heavy emphasis on a desire to uh, attain historical legitimacy. So does Confucius play a role for them in terms of you know, attaining some of that historical legitimacy as the party being the you know, continuing representative, if you will, of that ancient uh, well, I think the party is trying to. I, I don't know how much this will help with their minority issues, which is a separate issue. But. Who who, uh, who don't necessarily share the, <laughs> the same traditions, right? Uh, but I think they are trying to sell the Chinese Communist Party as the defender of Chinese tradition against outside influence. Mm. Uh, they are trying to paint the party as as a natural <laughs> extension yeah. of previous political regimes. Mm -hmm. um, to a certain extent, they will never use this language, but they're, they're trying to sell it as you know, uh, another imperial you know, government with a new set of emperors. Mm -hmm. uh, that language will never get used, but that, that's effectively what they're doing. They're, it's very they're, they're saying that, <laughs> that, they're, they're, that the Communist Party is an inheritor of yeah. you know, a couple millennia of Tradition. political traditions, mm -hmm. and that they are the defender of these mm -hmm. uh, traditions and, and, this, and this history. Whether they can kind of sell this idea to the greater public, mm. uh, we don't know, and of course it's very hard to tell. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, that's that's I think part of also what I, we were talking about earlier about this, the greater effort of the Chinese government to present an alternative system mm. to the world. Yeah. Uh, it's a big part of this that they, that that the Communist Party is representative of of something much deeper in Chinese history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. 
Okay, well, thank you. Why don't we open it up to the audience for questions? Um, and per standard CSIS practice, if you can introduce yourself uh, and uh, say where you're from, uh, organizationally or otherwise, and please do restrict your uh, question to a question, not a soliloquy. And wait for the wait for the mic. Uh, the gentleman in the very back there, first hand up. Ken Dillon, CNC Press. Is it, is it possible that? In addition to aiming this Confucianism against the West, there's also a more covert aim, and that is to try to suppress uh, the revival of religious, uh, indigenous religious uh, movements, uh, particularly Buddhist, Falun Gong, and so on. I only got a few. I missed a few words. I, I think question. the question is: yeah. uh, is the is the party using Confucianism to suppress, uh, you know, in that quest for meaning, uh, in spiritual meaning, and right. so on, the reintroduction of other forms oh, of traditional oh, religions oh, like problem. Buddhism? No, no, that's what I you do talk okay. about this in the book: the Buddhism yeah. versus. Um, not really. I mean, I, I think what's going on in China and, and other parts of the region is uh, something more general: uh, return to a tradition. Um, you know, I, I met an academic uh, gentleman named Kishor Mababani, who's, who's the dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School in, in Singapore. And the way he described it was that Asia has gained, he's, he said, cultural confidence. For much of the last 100, 150 years, uh, being modern meant being Western mm -hmm. and becoming more and more Westernized. And I think that's beginning to change in, in Asia, where now that the region has been so successful, I think people are going back to their, their, their own traditions and saying, hey, you know, maybe we can be Asian and modern and, and successful. Mm. And you're, you're seeing people from all walks of life uh, return to old, re reading about old doctrines, uh, you know, ancient literature, all kinds of things like that. And it's not just Confucius. Confucius is a, is a primary one because of the influence that Confucius has had on the region. But it's also Taoism and, and Buddhism. There's been a big Buddhist revival in China as well. I'm always surprised when, you, when I meet people at businessmen and that kind of thing, how, how often they'll start talking about some ancient text they just read. I, I, was, uh, I did an interview a year ago with the CEO of Hire, the appliance mm -hmm. company. Yeah. And I mentioned, somehow it came up in conversation, I was writing this book. On Confucius, he says, "Oh, I, I like Confucius, but I much prefer Taoism." And he starts going <laughs> on about Taoism. So, so I, I think well, I think what you're seeing is something actually much much bigger. Uh, and I, this is going to have, uh, I think, um, amazing uh, consequences for not just Asia but for for global society generally. Hmm. That these Asian traditions, philosophical traditions, religious traditions, I think are going to be playing a much bigger role on the world stage, just like. Asian economies are, and just like it, Asia is becoming more important politically as well. So uh, you're going to see Asia contributing more and more to, to kind of a, a global culture. Great. Uh, let's go with the woman here in the red scarf. That's you. Yeah. Uh, no, the woman with the red scarf. Uh, <laughs> <okay>. I'm <laughs> no sorry no to steal your mic <laughs> moment. Um, hi, sorry, I'm Jacqueline. And a moment ago, you were. Where are you from, Jacqueline? Sorry. Oh, I'm just from DC. No worries. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, no official no affiliation. No um, a second ago, you were talking about like a conversation that you had just with someone who who was reading Taoism, who was reading Confucianism. When you're talking about things that government officials here or business leaders here should pay attention to uh, in regards to this resurgence of Confucianism, should they be paying more attention to? what government officials like Xi Jinping are talking about um, when he's talking about what he thinks Confucianism looks like? Or should we be paying more attention to things like, um, like Yudan and the popular philosophical books, maybe, that um, everyday like Chinese or Americans might be reading, like, I guess? You're, you're talking about the public at large. What they yeah, I guess not just, um, not just in China. Um, I don't know if Yudan is popular everywhere, <laughs> um, but it was where I lived, or she was where I lived. But even um, uh, like people in Taiwan who are bringing back uh, right. like Wu Jingxiong, um, uh -huh. the, the Christian Confucian dialogues, or 
um, people who are bringing Confucianism into dialogue with all sorts of different things. Do we look more at um, like what the academics are saying, like Yu Hua, or do we look at what Xi Jinping is saying, or do we look at what's selling well in China? Like, I guess I'm. I guess my question is, where do you think? Um, I don't know. What sources do you think uh, this resurgence is going to pull from? Is it going to be the government, or is it going to be some of these other areas? Okay. Well, I, uh, certainly, said I think it depends on who you are. I think if you're a scholar here at CSIS, I'd be very interested in what Xi Jinping is saying about Confucius and what role it plays in policy and what that means for China's relations with the rest, rest of the world. Uh, but I think what, you, what you're going to see going on in, in this kind of revival of tradition is that different people are going to be taking different things from these, these doctrines and, and ideas. And uh, I th that's actually a great thing. There's going to be, uh, I think, a revived, uh, revival of debate over uh, what, wh where, what value these traditions have in the modern world, what they mean, what they mean to different people, uh, and what role they should play go you know, going forward. And in some cases, some of these ideas may, uh, may, we may look at them and decide that they're out of date. Uh, for example, some Confucian ideas on, on women I think there's a lot of women in Asia who would say, well, we don't really need this anymore. <laughs> uh, but, but then though, uh, people will, will, but then there's other people who are looking at this on an entirely personal level, looking for kind of spiritual nourishment in a, in a changing world. Uh, and so I, I think what you're seeing going on is different people reattaching to Confucian texts and ideas and for their own purposes and uh, gaining from it in very, very different ways, and that this, they're going to contribute to modern society in very different ways based on what they get out of it. And I think that's, that's a great thing. I think the danger here is that uh, people do take one reading of Confucius, that people will take the Xi Jinping version as the, the sole uh, orthodoxy on Confucius. Uh, and not revisit it themselves and determine what it means, what it means to them, and what it should mean in modern society. Gentleman here in yeah. the black. Thank you. I'm Matthias Ilivitsky, research intern at the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation. I was very happy to hear that Marxism is no longer playing an important part, uh, legitimacy, uh, the legitimacy of the Chinese government. And considering that China is still the biggest uh, country on earth professing uh, to defend a communist government, I wanted to ask you if it's possible or quite optimistic to wait for an open break with communist ideology from the part of either the Chinese current political authorities or the Chinese Communist Party. Thank you. Yeah, I actually had a lot of trouble hearing that so question. I, th I think the to, question is basically, does Sorry? Confucianism or these other, you know, you mentioned just now the sort of debate right. that this is stirring, uh, what is the possibility that it could act as an alternative ideology to the Communist Party? Oh, right. Or well, would, the, yeah. would the leadership right, right, at some right. point okay. be willing okay. to dump communism yeah. and go with something like this? Well, that, that's, that's interesting. It's an interesting question because if you go back and you read, read the Analects, uh, you'll find that uh, Confucius was uh, um, not terribly afraid of standing up to authority, uh, contrary to what we really think of him, <clears throat> that he basically spent his entire life wandering around China telling the ruling elite of, of the day that they didn't know what they were doing and they should follow his ideas. Um, <laughs> and he didn't, he didn't believe in serving governments that he, could, he felt were immoral uh, or, or corrupt, uh, that he would rather be unemployed. Uh, so I think if, if what the, the, the Communist Party in that way is actually somewhat taking of a little risk, that they think Confucius is going to be able to help them sustain the current system. Uh, and suppress dissent. But as people go back and read the Analects and they see what Confucius did in his own life and what he said about government and the high standards, high moral standards that he held government officials to, uh, then you have to wonder, well, will Confucius actually end up creating a, a, a form of opposition to the current government rather than a support for, for the government? Uh, which Confucius will they choose to, to adhere to? Uh, and I think that's a fascinating question. Uh, 
people are reading the analects again, and they are they're they're going to take a lot of their own ideas from it, and and they're going to mix those ideas and the new ideas they get from the outside world. Mm. Uh, that you know, China is China is not a, a closed society. People are traveling or being educated overseas. They're coming back. You know, they 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 go to Harvard. They go back to China with all kinds of you know different ideas they had than they had when they left. So. How do Confucian principles mix into these global ideas, and what does that mean for the Communist Party going forward? We don't know any of the answers of any of these questions, but it'll definitely be interesting. I think, I, I think the fact that he was constantly telling government they didn't know what they were doing, so he may have been the original think tanker, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> sure. uh, and, and no one listened to him. So yeah, I guess that's it's, right. all the, it's, it's a perfect it's analogy. It's then. almost exactly the same. The woman in the back with the glasses <laughs> and the blonde hair, yep. Hi, my name is Barbara Dello, and I'm from New York. Um, I think earlier you said um, something about Confucius' ideas kind of being the basis or the essence of Chinese culture. Um, and I wondered what um, character or which of his um, ideas would you say are most important that have um, kind of followed through and um, kind of helped formulate uh, Chinese culture? I'm gonna, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, so I think you repeat all the no, questions. No, 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 no problem. There's <laughs> something weird with the echo that I'm having trouble hearing no problem, everyone. No yeah. I, the question is yeah. basically, uh, from his teachings, you, you mentioned that it's very central to Chinese culture. Right. You know, uh, and, and so I think she's asking, what elements of the teachings do you think have been the most uh, key oh, in oh, defining okay. Chinese culture? Okay. Do I have that right, ma'am? Is that where you were? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, sorry about that. Um, I need a translator from English to English somehow. <laughs> <laughs> how that happened. <laughs> Anyway, so uh, I, I would I would have there's there's a lot of Confucian influence that's still around, and and you would think it. I mean, I, I, obviously it's an age of globalization, and just like any society, China and South Korea and Japan are not as traditional as they used to be. Just like society here is not as traditional, however you want to define that, as as, as it used to be. Uh, so Confucian ideas have become mixed in with all kinds of other stuff. As, at the same time, you know, you, you'll find uh, that things don't work the same way in Asia as they do here. And a lot of that is Confucian influence. And, and people won't necessarily identify it as Confucian. They'll just say, oh, this is what we do every day. <laughs> but, but ultimately, its background is in Confucian ideas. I think most of all, uh, it, it happens in the family, uh, where the ideas of filial piety and, and really well, the way relations in the family are supposed to be are are still actually quite strong. Mm. And uh, yeah, maybe they become a little more westernized on the margins. Uh, but the core is still there. And you know, I found that out myself. My, my wife is Korean American and grew up in the Midwest and is about as American as, as, as anybody most of the time. Uh, and then you hit her on certain issues and you find out that those traditions are still there, passed down you know, within her family, even in, outside of Chicago. Filial piety being probably the top of the list. Uh, I'm expected to be the good, the good Asian uh, son-in-law, even though I'm not Asian. And if I fall out of line, you don't want to fall out of line. Uh, I, I think you'll also find it, uh, uh, not all the influences are positive. We, I mentioned how a lot of women who, especially those who are professionally oriented, will, uh, will rant uh, about co continued Confucian influence. And, uh, in society and, and especially in the, in the corporate world, uh, there has to be a, a reason why uh, women play a much smaller role in, in corporations in Japan and South Korea than they do in the U.S. Uh, you know, there's an international monetary fund study done about, uh, I think it was 2012, that showed that only 9% of management positions in Japan and South Korea are held by women. In the U.S., it was 43%. Uh, and these are prejudices that, though Confucius himself did not outline them very clearly, became a part of Confucian tradition of the separation between the outer world and the inner world. The, the outer realm was where what was for men, and it was politics and commerce and civic life. And the inner world was the household where uh, managing the home, raising children. Each role was equally important in the Confucian way of thinking. Uh, someone had to raise good good moral children at home, uh, and that role was handed to women. Um, but in, in, in modern times, what it does, it, it, it prevents women from 
uh, playing the role in society that they that they they, they, they want to play. So I think these uh, these ideas live on both positively and and negatively in, in, in many ways that I think a lot of people themselves don't even really necessarily recognize. I think I've been neglecting the front rows here, so let's take one from the front. Yeah, uh, just wait for the microphone. Wait for the microphone, please. My name is Ann Vroom, and I'm from DC. I had a question for you from sort of the author's perspective. Um, I'm old enough to remember back to the Gang of Four era, where you had actual anti-Confucianism <coughs> oppression. And of course, prior to that, many Confucian scholars imprisoned, um, et cetera, uh, as part of the old regime way of thinking, pre-Mao. Um, do you ever sort of feel a twinge of uh, uh, sympathy for those people who tried to, as scholars, maintain the Confucian body of knowledge who were, uh, you know, in some instances, again, uh, obliterated for that in that context. Uh, just as an author, sort of a sympathy to authors who tried to, you know, maintain the, the body of knowledge and, and were repressed for that reason. Uh, well, you know, there's, when you look throughout uh, Confucian history, uh, the Confucians have a reputation of being uh, sycophantic isn't quite a little too strong, <laughs> but you know the Confucians had a reputation of basically of being True. officials <laughs> officials of the state, right? They took their they they studied their Confucian classics, they took their exams, and they then they filed into the bureaucracy, and they were basically the the the, the pillar of the imperial regime. Um, but when you kind of read about a lot of Confucians over the years, you, you found out that they could also be a pretty belligerent, angry bunch who often did, did not agree what the what the you know, the royal the royal court was doing, and were not particularly shy about uh, explain, uh, explaining themselves and arguing. And um, I think this is a great Confucian tradition that often gets gets overlooked. And you know these 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 people in China. Who uh, attempted to defend not just kind of defend Confucian tradition and Chinese tradition, but you know, were willing to stand up to the government generally are part of are part of that tradition. Uh, you know, Confucius believed that you weren't doing your duty unless you remonstrated. A word that comes up a lot in old in old Confucian texts, unless you unless you remonstrated w with authority. Even if you ended up losing the argument, it wasn't the point. You kind of had to make the argument. <laughs> Otherwise, you, you weren't doing your job. Uh, and unfortunately, that, that Confucian sentiment is, is often, is often <laughs> overlooked. Um, and you'll see in China today, whether, I don't know if it's a Confucian tradition or not, but you'll see people in China today take, take great risks to stand up for what they, they believe in. Uh, and um, in a way that, we in the we here in the U.S. don't have to at all, mm -hmm. and uh, they're they're willing to do it, and that's what makes, as we were mentioning earlier, now that you have a reintroduction of Confucian ideas, you know, how does that play in, play into this? Uh, does does the government win this battle, and they they have a Confucius that supports the government, uh, or do the do the public take? A different view of Confucius and what he meant and what he tried to do, and, and how does that that play itself out? So, on a personal level, you asked me a personal question. I didn't give you a personal answer, but on on a personal level, you know, I'm I'm I have uh, incredible respect for the people who have the the guts to stand up to the current government in China, and there are a lot of them, and a lot of people do it in all kinds of small ways, and uh, uh, it's, it's something that. Um, I mean, I, I'm an outsider, and you know, I'm, I'm a journalist, and I write things about China that I don't think the government likes very much. But I have American passport, and I don't take the same risks uh, that these people do. So I have tremendous respect for them. OK, I think we have time for one last one. Sure, right here in the, in the sweater. And Jack. <laughs> Could you um, compare and contrast a little bit between the Confucius of China and the Confucius of its neighbors and the way they interpreted him. And is there any bearing uh, from the differences on their modern relationships? 
I'm sorry, can you compare Confucian culture in China to? Like, for example, Japan or Korea. Again, I, didn't, I only got the first so, part so of the question. Can, can, you, can you compare yeah. Confucianism as it exists in China or how it's evolved in China to other Confucian societies? Oh, like other Confucian societies. Okay, I, I thought that's what you said. I actually heard that one. Okay. <laughs> uh, I didn't actually need that translation. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll be sending you a bill for interpretation, <laughs> by, by the way. <laughs> um, uh, oh, that's, that's a huge question. Um, what's actually, what I found interesting is, in reading Confucian history, is how it was actually the Neo-Confucian uh, reformation of Confucianism is what that really took hold in a big way around the region. Uh, and, and so you had Confucian influence in, in Korea and to a lesser extent Japan, to some extent in Vietnam at, a, at an earlier stage than the Neo-Confucian. So this is, we're talking uh, going, going to the uh, 12th and 13th centuries. Um, but you saw kind of a, a much more dramatic impact uh, after it took on that Neo-Confucian aspects, when those aspects were actually much more, in many ways, much more spiritual and, and uh, a much more comprehensive doctrine uh, about life and other things. They were, it, it had stolen ideas from Buddhism and, 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 and other stuff. So a lot of what you see in Korea and Japan is, all, is almost a, a very late stage of how Confucianism had developed in, in China. Uh, well, uh, you know, this uh, has been great, Michael. Thank you so much for Thank sharing you. your, uh, you know, so often when we do our events, I, I've been doing them all day to day, unfortunately, where we spend our time salaciously guessing what Xi Jinping's going to do and who he's going to knock off next and, <laughs> and so on and so on. And so this has been very refreshing to think about something that's a little more uh, sort of, uh, uh, mind enabling in, in, in content, so thank you. And I really want to thank the audience. You guys have been very interactive and I really appreciate that. So let, please join me in thanking Michael. Thank you. Thank you. And buy a book. <laughs>